Hey, you have come to the right place for encouragement today. So go ahead and click the subscribe button so that you can be connected to all the videos that we upload all throughout the week. Now, you may feel led to get connected to the ministry as you're watching this video, and we've made that super simple for you. Go ahead and check out our description to find out the ways that you can connect with us. Now, while you're watching, you may also feel led to sow into the ministry, and we encourage that because we know that our ministry can reach those that are far, near, and in our backyard. We have outreaches all throughout the year, and you will help us tremendously by sowing into our ministry. Thanks for watching. Now check out this message. Through the scriptures, digging is used in, in a relation in a lot of ways to purpose or comparison to, to purpose and, and promises. And we're going to see this over the next several weeks that through the Bible, God uses digging as, as a representation or an illustration of finding your calling, finding your purpose, finding your identity, finding your promise. And that's what we're going to see today with Isaac. Isaac's story is often overlooked. When we think of Isaac, the son of Abraham, we, we often look at the, the journey that him and his father took. And that's usually where Isaac's story stops in most people's minds. But Isaac's story is so broad. Isaac's story is, is complicated in a lot of ways. Isaac did not have the easiest life. When you go back and you look at his childhood, Isaac actually had a really jacked up upbringing. I mean, if you look at it, you'll see that when Isaac was growing up, Isaac grew up with tension in his home. Imagine, imagine, imagine having to sit at dinner every night and look at your mother, stare at your father, his mistress, and their child every day at the dinner table. Because Hagar and Ishmael lived in the same house as Isaac and Sarah. And, and the scripture makes it clear that Hagar would actually pick on Sarah. Imagine just being a child and, and watching your father's Mistress, pick on your mother. Isaac grew up with tension in the house. Isaac grew up with trauma. Yeah, trauma. It says that when Isaac was living in the home. It says that Sarai and Hagar were going back and forth and often his father would side with the mistress. This is traumatizing to grow up in this setting. To have to sit back and watch dad decide who he's going to pick up the football and play with? To, to watch dad wrestle between who gets his love? It is traumatizing. Isaac grew up with turmoil all in the house. For the Bible says that as Isaac was, was wrestling... It got so bad that now Sarai was beginning to attack Hagar publicly. 
He's watching a home that's supposed to be a place of peace. Now it is becoming a place of war. Hagar started picking on Sarah and flaunting that she got pregnant in front of Sarah. And, and, and eventually it got so bad that, that Sarah wanted to kick her out of the house. And all of this stuff, Isaac's just sitting back and watching. And if that wasn't bad enough, Isaac grew up in trouble. Because Ishmael got to the place where he started picking on Isaac. The backup plan is now picking on the promise. Isaac had to fight through his childhood. He grew up in trauma. He, he grew up with tension. He, he grew up with turmoil. He, he grew up with trouble. But the last point really shocks me. Because most people that grew up in these things would, would have issues with the last one. Most people that grew up with these things would excuse themselves out of practicing the last one. Most people, if they watched their father act how Abraham acted. I mean, think about it. Your father moves his mistress and the baby into your house. Your father takes sides with the mistress often. Your father watches the other son pick on you and doesn't step in. Your father is watching his wife struggle because of what he did and doesn't do nothing. Most people, if they watch their father make these kind of decisions, would struggle with the last one. What's the last one? Well, Isaac grew up with trust. As a young boy, he never lost his trust in his father. Most of the stuff I just mentioned, we would have said goodbye to trust. We, we would not favor our, our fathers. We, we would back away from, from husbands even. If you were in the position of Sarai. But the reason Isaac grew up with trust is because no matter how bad it got with Sarai, no matter how stupid Abraham acted and got, she never stopped trusting him. Why did she trust him? Why did Isaac trust him when he clearly acted so stupid? It's because just because he made stupid decisions, he did not have stupid faith in his God. Mm, that's good. And whenever a man or a woman has trust in God, you can always rest assured that though they make stupid decisions in their lifetime, eventually if they have great trust in God, you can ride it out with them because eventually they're going to become the man or woman that God is calling them to be. So when I can't trust you, I trust my God. Isaac grew up in trust. He would not have grown up in trust if his mother would have dogged his father throughout all his life. He grew up in great trust because his mother cultivated an environment of trust in Abraham. For Peter says it like this, Sarah referred to Abraham as her Lord. An unperfect man, she called her Lord. And because of this, even though home was toxic, Isaac didn't grow up toxic. And there is a way to cause your 
Isaacs to not grow up toxic if you don't allow the toxicity to become the star of the home. Isaac grew up with trust. How can you prove that he grew up with trust? Well, when he walked up the mountain with his father, we tend to think of this story as Isaac being a little boy, but actually, Josephus says, the Jewish historian, that Isaac would have been 33 years old, the same age as Jesus. His father is an old man at this point. Isaac could have fought his father. Isaac could have resisted his father. Isaac could have pushed his father down and went the other way. But he watched his daddy with the knife. And he carried the wood on his back as a good son. And even allowed his father to tie him to an altar. But as his father began to raise the knife in the air, God called out from heaven to Abraham. And understand this. Isaac heard his father talking to God. To every father, when's the last time your child has heard you talking to God? He witnessed his father having a conversation with God. And this is not the first time he's heard his daddy talking to God. He's watched his imperfect daddy walk with God for a long time. He watched his imperfect daddy leave everything to follow God. And the reason he looked at his daddy and said, I see the wood and I see the knife, but where's the sacrifice? Is because his father taught him that you never go before God's presence without a gift in your hand. And so the unperfect, the imperfect man at least got one thing right in his life. He showed his son how to get God's attention. I've learned in life that it is often some of the most jacked up people that get God's attention to the most. It is people like Paul who say the good I want to do, I don't find myself doing. It's the evil I find myself doing. Oh, Lord, I prayed three times that this thorn would be removed. But every time I prayed, you said no. The writer of the New Testament, 70% of it, that is, said, I preach and I'm not perfect. I write and I got issues. But here's the thing. I don't let my issues keep me from getting God's attention. So Isaac would listen to his dad have a conversation with God. And he said, lay not your hand on the lad. Don't do anything unto him. For now I know you fear God, seeing you have not withhold your son, thy only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him in a ram was a ram caught in the thicket by his horn. And Abraham went back, took the ram, offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place. And I said this last week. He did not call God Jehovah Jireh. He called the place Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh is wherever God keeps blessing you. He called the place. We call God Jehovah Jireh. God's name is not Jehovah Jireh. He called the, the place Jehovah Jireh. And it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And the angel called out the second time and spoke blessings. And I'm not going to read them today, but blessings all over Abraham. Isaac just sat back listening. And shortly after this story, the great patriarch Abraham would help find Isaac a wife named Rebecca, and he would die. And now, Isaac has to figure out life without his father. 
It's easy when you have a father that's never been around. It's easy when you never really had a father that was present in your life. You learn how to survive. But good men and good women are hard to replace. It's hard. How do you replace Abraham? The great Abraham who talked with God, who is the father of faith. He was known as the father of faith because everything tied to his life said faith. He was not perfect. He was jacked up. But man, did he have some faith in his God. And now Isaac has to figure out what does life look like without my father? And so he begins the journey. And as he begins the journey as a young father and not married that long, it says in Genesis 26, 1, that a famine hit the land. Besides the first that was in the days of Abraham. Abraham had a famine and went down to Egypt Isaac now has to survive a famine. And understand, famines will hit you in life. I'm not talking about the kind of famine. I remember when I was in Ghana and we, or no, Kenya, and we went up to the bush and we met with the tribe leaders. And they were thanking the person I went with for building them a well. Because the well was built to stop a war because people and tribes were killing each other over this one particular well because they wanted water. The famine was so bad that they were finding dead people on the sides of the road that were exhausted from walking. There was one woman they found that, that, was, that was dead and the, it was so, the famine was so bad that she was pregnant and the bees were attacking her for the fluid in her stomach. And so when he heard, he built them a well. And it ended the war. And to this day, it is the main well in the bush. And they were explaining how bad famines get in their part of the world. In America, we've been blessed to not really have famines. When we hit a famine, the worst that really happens to us is we can't wash our cars. So we really can't understand what a real famine looks like. But famines have ways of attacking in different ways. It's not just famine in the land. Sometimes it's a famine in your marriage. The love left a long time ago. It is a famine for love now. A famine for intimacy. A famine for opportunity. You are so smart, but you cannot find a job anywhere. Sometimes it is a famine in your body. Disease is attacking you. And you are having a famine for healing. Sometimes it could be a famine for affirmation, a famine for affection, a famine to be appreciated. I wonder today how many people are in a famine right now. Isaac has found himself in a famine and his father survived a famine. But his father is not here to tell him how to do it. So he has to go off of the stories and the experiences that he's had with his father. So the famine hits the land. And understand, when the famine hit the land with Abraham, he went down to Egypt. And it may not have been the best decision because in going down to Egypt is where he would hook up or find at least his mistress named Hagar. Abraham left the land 
to survive. Isaac has to stay. And understand that Gerar is not a place that Isaac wants to stay because all of his bad experiences from his childhood came in Gerar. He's in a famine, but he's stuck in the place that caused his childhood to be a famine. And what do you do when God tells you to stay somewhere that you don't want to be? Stay somewhere that's tied to the hardest season of your life. I've learned that when God is up to something in somebody's life, he often has them stay in a place that they want to run from. And if you can stay, the Bible says, having done all to stand, stand. It's easy to run. But here's the thing with running. Once you run, run once, running becomes a way of life. Every job that hurts your feelings, you run. Every relationship that hurts your feelings, you run. Every church that hurts your feelings, you run. And the question becomes, when does the running stop? God says, don't go down to Egypt. I'm doing something different in your life than what I did in your dad's life. Isaac, you are the child of promise. I'm doing something in your life so that you don't have to live with the pain your father lived with. I'm not sending you to Egypt. Dwell in the land, I tell you. Sojourn in this land. And understand, I know it's a famine, but I'll be with you. And I'll bless you. For unto thee and your seed, I'll give these countries. I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, thy father. I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. Give thy seed to the countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because your father obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, and my statutes and my laws. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And the men of the place asked him about his wife because she was pretty. Now, if you know your Bible, Abraham made this mistake too with, with the men of Gerar and the king of Gerar named Abimelech when he was asked about his wife and he said, oh no, she's my sister. And God shut the wombs of every woman in the city and God gave Abimelech a deadly disease because... He was ready to hurt Isaac or Abraham. The people of Gerar are very familiar with Abraham's family. But here's that daddy thing kicking in. Because understand, you don't just get the good stuff with your parents. You also get some of the bad stuff too. And so he does that thing his dad did. But when Abimelech saw them, the Bible says, it says he saw him fondling his wife. I don't know what fondling means in the Old Testament. I know what it means now, but it says Abimelech looked out his window and saw him fondling his wife. And it says that he knew right away what this was. And he confronted Isaac and said, why did you do this? Because I know what happened when I did this with your father. Why would you bring this on my land? I don't want to get sick again. I, I, I don't want the women to, to, to not be able to give birth again. See, the enemy knows how dangerous it is to touch you. And, and once you start tapping into who your father is, it causes the enemy to step back and say, I don't want no heat. I know what happens when I mess with God's children. I know what happens when I mess with God's called. I know what happens when I attack somebody that Christ died for. So Abimelech says to everybody in Gerar, if you touch them, I will kill you. So Isaac stays in the land. That God told him to go to. And this is where our story gets good. So Isaac in verse 12 it says. Sowed in that land. 
It, it is a land in the famine, but he's sowing in the land. He's sowing in the place that God positioned him. You cannot get a harvest sowing in a place that God has not called you to. He sowed where God placed him. And it says, and in that same year, whenever I see people sowing, but I don't see a same year blessing, it is clear to me their sowing is divided. They're not fully sowing where God placed them. They may be sowing here and they may be sowing there, but God says you cannot get a blessing until you sow where I have planted you. He sowed in the same place and in that year for somebody God is saying, if you can take where he has positioned you serious and start sowing your time, start sowing your talent, start sowing your treasure, God says this time next year, your whole life can change. This time next year, your world can be different. This time next year, you won't be crying yourself to sleep. This time next year, you won't be on Christian Mingle. This time next year, you won't be in therapy for your marriage. This time next year, you won't need dialysis. This time next year, you won't need the doctor's checkups every single week. This time next year, you won't be in the principal's office. This time next year, you won't be wondering if the money is in the bank. This time next year, you won't question if you get the loan. This time next year, your whole world could be different. This time next year, you can have the job. This time next year, you can have the man, have the woman, have the opportunity, have the healing, have the joy, have the peace. Have the strength. This time next year, everything is changing. Say something's about to happen. It says that time a year later, he got back a hundredfold. I said this in the opening. I used to think when I would read, because Jesus said, and some received 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold blessings. And I used to think that was like, okay, a 30% blessing. That was like a one-third blessing. And 60-fold was like a two-third blessing. That meant 60% is coming back to me. And then a hundred-fold was a hundred percent, and that's the goal. But then when I read a hundred-fold blessing means a hundred percent return, that means that every seed I throw will grow. Every seed I throw will grow. So if I sow a thousand seeds, I will have 100% of them come back to me in my harvest. There there will be no wasted. See, there's a story in the Bible that's not often preached. And it's found in in Genesis 38. And it it talks about the man who was, was having sexual relations. And right before the moment, because they didn't have protection in biblical days, right before the moment, he he stopped what he was doing. I'm trying to say this as PG as possible. And and he let the seed hit the ground. And God killed him. Why did God kill him? Because seed is potential. If you have the faith the size of a mustard, seed is potential. And he killed the man because he wasted potential. God is saying, I hate wasted seed. This is going to be a season where no potential is wasted in your life. 
This is going to be a season where nothing gets wasted in your life. No day is going to get wasted. No time is going to get wasted. No amount of love you put out is going to get wasted. No energy you put out is going to get wasted. God is saying this is going to be a hundredfold return kind of year for you. But you cannot have a harvest. If you hold your seed, the scripture says those that sow sparingly will reap sparingly. Those that sow bountifully will reap bountifully. What he's saying is your life is a reflection of your sowing. Wow. I was talking to Kali the other week, the one that just said, wow. And, and she's been on a mission to get all of our outreaches covered. And people have been giving that are tied to her in the thousands. Literally, I'm not exaggerating. Am I telling the truth? And she said, I'm just so mad at the people that won't give. And I said, you can't get mad at people that don't want to give to church. Because a lot of people don't like church. That's just the reality of it. But she began to share her story how when she started coming to the church, she was broke and not just broke at an end to that broke in. And she started tithing. And she started being consistent. And in just a short amount of time, she went from struggling to being our largest giver in our ministry. How do you go from not knowing how you're going to pay your bills to now being the largest giver in a church full of successful people? Because when you sow where God has positioned you, God cannot lie. He says in verse 10, he says, he gives, I give seed to the sower. So the more you sow where God has placed you, God says, I promise to keep filling your bag. So every time I reach down, I don't need to pull up my bank app to see if I can do it. Every time I reach down, I know that God is going to make sure that my bag is filled with seed. How good would life be if you didn't have to check your account at the grocery store and check your account for Christmas school clothes and check your account to buy things? God is saying, if I can get you to sow where I placed you, all you have to do is reach down. But if you keep Playing it safe so sparingly. Be not deceived, God says. I'm not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that. Whatever you give to God, that. Give your time to God, God will give you time back. Give your life to God, God will give you good life. But none of those things make God give you money because it takes giving God money to get money back. Give and it shall be given unto you. It's reaping and sowing. God told Noah, I'll never flood the earth again. But here's how the earth and here's how people will be judged moving forward. It is Genesis 8.22. It is seed time, harvest time. So if you keep your seed, you can have no harvest. So Isaac knew this is where God has placed me. I'm going to sow. I'm going to sow. I'm going to sow. And a hundred percent of what he sowed came back in a year. God didn't need a long time. He just needed God to sow. And you know why it was so easy for him to give his seed? It would probably be easy for me if I experienced this too. It was easy for him to give his seed 
because he watched his father love God so much that he was willing to give God him. If I watch my daddy tie me to an altar, you think it's hard for me to give God seed? I'm glad God didn't say get Esau or Jacob and take them up a mountain. It's easy to give when it's modeled in front of you. So he, 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 he gave. And look, look at what it says in, in verse 13. It says, and the man waxed great. Look at what his sowing has done for him. It's not him, it's God. The man became great. And here's what greatness does. Here's what losers do. Here's the difference between greatness and weakness. Winners and losers. Greatness moves forward. Weakness stays backwards. I've never seen a great person living yesterday. Greatness moves forward. I'm not looking at what didn't happen in my childhood. I'm not looking at what went wrong in my teenage years. I'm not paying attention to what happened in my 20s. Greatness moves forward. So if you ever wonder if somebody's great or weak, look at where they stay. People that stay in yesterday will never become great. He moved forward. For someone listening, for someone online, this is a move forward season. I, I know it broke your heart. I, I know it put you in therapy. I know you couldn't get out of bed for six months because of it. Because of it. I, I know it left you scared. I know it left you traumatized. But God is saying, don't let what happened yesterday keep you from everything that he has in store for you tomorrow. This is a moving forward season. So what does that mean? When he calls me, I don't have time for him again. I am moving forward. When that job says they want me back, I'm looking for something better. Why? Because I am moving forward. When the doctor says they've cured the cancer or God has taken away the cancer, I'm not living with fear, wondering if it's going to come back. Why? Because I am moving forward forward. I can't stay where I used to be. I can't wrestle with what I used to wrestle with. This is a moving forward kind of season. And God is saying that if you have the faith to move forward, I have the power to kill your Pharaoh so that he never comes after you again. This is your moving forward season. Say I'm moving on. And he moved forward and he went from great to very great because your greatness will only increase as you walk with God. For he had possessions of flocks, possessions of herd, great store of servants and the Philistines envy him. Look at how he is getting better in the famine. Everybody else is losing in the famine. The reason they envy him is because they don't have what he has. Yeah. And I've learned this. The quickest way to know that you are becoming great mm. is by looking at how many haters you have. Yeah. They envy you because they ain't you. So now they are jealous of him. But he's been through this before. For Ishmael envied him. That's why he picked on him. He was jealous that Isaac was the son of the promise. And what you see here is how everything the young boy went through was preparation for what his old man would step into. I didn't realize that everything I went through on the front end of my life was to prepare me for what I'm stepping into in the back end of my life. They envied him. 
for all the wells which his father had digged in the days of Abraham, his father. Here's what they did. They filled them with dirt. See, they waited till Abraham died because they knew what attacking Abraham would cause. They seen how attacking him caused all the women to not be able to get pregnant. They saw how attacking him caused the king to get a terminal sickness. They said, yeah, we're not going to mess with Abraham. But when Abraham died, why did they wait till Abraham died? Not just because they were afraid of him, but Abraham was the father of faith. And whenever faith in your life dies, the enemy will fill in what you've dug. So they filled in all the wells his father had dug. And Abimelech said, go, leave, you're mightier than us. And Isaac left, rejected. He's rejected again. Abimelech, the, the, the one who, you know, his father went back and forth with, Abimelech, kicked him out. So what, what does Isaac do in verse 18? He digged again the wells of water, which they pitched in the days of Abraham, his father, for the Philistines stopped them after the death of Abraham. He called their names by which the names by which his father had called them. What did Isaac do when he was rejected? Did he say something? Did he swing at him? Did he pray that God would take him out? He just started digging. He just started digging. That's what we are supposed to do when life is turning on us. God says, start digging. But he didn't go to any dirt. And he didn't just start digging from scratch. He went to the places his father dug. Why dig where your father has dug? Well, it's because if I dig where my daddy dug, the dirt will be much softer. If I dig where my daddy dug, it won't be as hard. What, what Isaac is saying is, if, if, if I'm going to dig, I want to make it easy. I don't want it to be as hard as it's supposed to be. I'm going to go where my father has been. I'm going to go where my father labored. I'm going to go where my father paid the price. And see, for some, the reason life is so hard is because you keep digging from scratch. Every relationship, you're digging from scratch. Every job, you're digging from scratch. When you go home, you're using methods and you're digging from scratch. And God is saying, if you want it to be easy in this season of your life, I need you to start looking for wells that have your father attached to them. Stop looking for things that you cannot see your daddy in. If you cannot see your daddy in it, you have no business giving it your time giving it your attention, giving it your resources. Isaac was looking for a place where the dirt was soft because that's where his father was. For the remainder of 2024, God is saying, can I make this thing easy for you? Can, can I show you that with me and you, it doesn't have to be so hard with me and you, you don't have to lose so much with me and you, your heart doesn't have to be ripped out on a regular basis with me and you, we can get those kids to the finish line with me and you, we can get that marriage to the finish line with me and you we can get that career or that business to the finish line God is telling somebody you're making life so hard when I want to make it easy say it's softer so he goes back and he starts digging where his father has been and see when you dig for a well, 
I used to think this, you're, you were digging to find just this big pool of water underground. But as I studied, I learned that when somebody is digging for a well, they're not digging for a big pool of underground water. They're, they're looking for a current of water. It's often just a, a, a very small stream going through the dirt. It, it's, it's called a, a current. And they're digging to find a current and then they dig the well. And what happens is the well, in a lot of ways, uh, collects the water and becomes the connector of the current to keep moving forward. So the, the, the water always stays at the level of the current. So the deeper you dig for the well, the more water your well will hold. But your, your well will never rise really heavier than where the current is. What am I saying here? Current, 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 current. This is where we get the word currency. If you find your well, you change your currency. And Isaac knew how his father was with finding God and currency. And so he dug. And here's the frustrating thing. He, he found the water and the people of Gerar fought him for the well. And he didn't fight back. He named it what it was. He called it Essex. Why? What's that name mean? Well, Essex means contention, oppression, and strife, violence, contention. He called it what it was, and he moved on. But look at how he didn't fight them, because this is how Isaac fought his battles. He just kept digging. They fought him. He dug. They called him things. He dug. And he went to the next well that his father dug. And, and once he found water, they fought him there too. And he called it Sitna. Means adversary or opponent. And then he moved on. And he's getting tired. He's getting frustrated because every time he digs, the enemy shows up. But he doesn't stop digging. He dug again. He dug again. And this is the trick to getting to the finish line. You never let something hit you so hard that it keeps you from digging again. Just because that didn't go right doesn't mean this won't go right. Just because that relationship went wrong doesn't mean this one will go wrong. Just because that opportunity went bad doesn't mean this opportunity is going to go bad. Sometimes the greatest act of faith you can take is to make up in your mind that no matter how much I'm attacked, I'm going to keep digging. So he called us sitting and he moved on. And he kept digging. This time he hit something. And it was big. It was the biggest well he discovered or found yet. And he called it Rehoboth. He said, for the Lord has made room for us. This is an open space. Look at how his digging has taken him to a place where God is showing him how big his life is, how big the possibilities are. See, if, if you don't dig, you'll never find your open space. If, if you never dig, you'll never tap into your potential.
If, if you never dig, you'll, you'll never get a glimpse of God's possibilities. If, if you never dig, you, you'll never tap in to your currency. If you never dig, you'll, you'll never tap in to your flow. This is why digging has to be a priority for you. Because yes, the first one went wrong. And yes, the second one went wrong. But, but one of these digs is going to go my way. One of these digs is going to make my life become so big. One of these digs is going to make people take me serious. One of these digs is going to provide unlimited resources. One of these digs is going to change my life. One of these digs is going to bring me new relationships. One of these digs is going to have people seeking me out. All I need is the right Dig. Look at somebody and say, I'm not quitting. With my heart broken, I'm not quitting. Say, I'm not quitting. With sickness in my body, I'm not quitting. Say, I'm not quitting. When opportunities don't go my way, say, I'm not quitting. Having gone through a divorce, say, I'm not quitting. 40 and not married, say, I'm not quitting. Still don't have the house, but say, I'm not quitting. Kids are driving me crazy, but say I'm not quitting. Because if God can find somebody that refuses to quit, he has found somebody that he can give an open space to. And I know it was God. Because it says that after they found the water, God showed up. And God said, I'm the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not. Why does God tell him to fear not? Because up until this point, everything has gone wrong. Have you ever been in a season or stuck in a cycle where everything in your life has gone wrong? And you're afraid that this one good thing is going to be like the rest? That's where Isaac is. His whole life has been tragic. And now all the wells he's been digging have been taken. And in the back of his mind, he's saying, this is so great, but it's probably going to be like every other time. And you have to be careful when you get into this mindset because often people that get into this mindset tend to practice self-sabotage. It's not that it's not God. It's just that you are so afraid that it's going to go wrong that you sabotage it yourself. So he says, I'm in this one. This is me. If you would have quit after the first one, you would have missed out hearing my voice like your father. If you would have quit at the second one, Isaac, I gave you the fight that you have so that you could get to this moment of unlimited possibilities. I'm with you. I'm going to bless you. With your life, I'm not going to do addition. With your life, I'm not going to do division. Because division subtracts. God is never in division. Remember, he said a house that is divided. Division is always the devil. God says, I'm not even the God of addition. Because addition takes too long. One plus one, two plus two. 100 plus 100. 100 plus 100 is way different than 100 times 100. God says the reason the dig is worth it is because once you find your Rehoboth, your life is going to move so fast because you are stepping into a season, not of addition, but multiplication. I will multiply your life. I will multiply, not your thoughts. I will multiply, not your prayers. 
I will multiply your seed. Oh, wait a minute. And Isaac sowed and gained a hundredfold. You mean to tell me my cheap seed God was using to teach me about my great life that's coming? And God was showing me that if he can trust me with my cheap seed, he can trust me with a great life? You, you mean to tell me that if I would have kept my seed in my bag, it would have kept me from understanding the multiplying of my seed for my future? You, you mean to tell me that if I would have kept my cheap seed in the bag, I would have kept my legacy from being multiplied. People that keep their seed tend to have a legacy that dies with them. And you're seeing it more and more nowadays. I was sitting at a conference and they were saying that nowadays millionaires and billionaires aren't leaving their money to their children. In the past, it would all be left. Now it's being divvied up to organizations because what this generation or the older generation is seeing is that their children cannot be trusted with wealth. That's the first thing. The second thing is they're realizing that they want their legacy to outlive them. And the way their legacy and their name outlives their casket is by making a difference in the world. Isaac was being taught through seed and famine about the greatness of what his seed would do in his life. I will multiply your seed. And here's how you know it's a word from God. Here's how you know. He built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched a tent there. I'm about to bring this home. But you know this was a word from God. Because the first well, he didn't build an altar. The second well, he didn't build an altar. The third well, he built an altar. And see, the word that you don't build an altar for is the word that does not work for you. The sacrifice to God seals the deal. It was never about seed. It was about sacrifice. And there's some people that a word like this is going to change and this, their lives and this time next year, their whole world is going to be different and others will have clapped today, but this time next year need another encouraging word too. Because when you hear words that challenge you and give you hope, God says the only way that word is activated in your life is when you sacrifice on it. There are people here right now, if I were to tell them to stand up, they would. But on a Sunday, I know because I usually see the records in the middle of the week when we have to decide what money goes out for bills. There are people that every week give two offerings. We've never taught that here, but they give two offerings. They give their tithe. And then there's services that hit their lives and they sow in the word. In the old church, you would see people come out and put money on the altar while the preacher was preaching. And I never understood it till I got older. But what they were doing was they were saying, God, I'm sacrificing on that promise that just came forth from your mouth. You know it's a word for you when it changes up your whole sacrifice system. And when he built the altar and pitched his tent there, you know what happened? Then, say then. then. King Abimelech came. The king that rejected him. The king that fought back and forth with his father. 
Then, meanwhile, Abimelech came with commanders and friends and said, Isaac, I'm sorry. I want a truce with you. I don't want to fight with you. It's clear God is with you because nobody would keep digging like you've kept digging if God was not with them. Which leads me to believe that if he's coming back after the altar, then God is touching his heart. And if God is touching his heart to come back after the altar, because if God touched his heart to come back, that means that when he rejected Isaac, that was God too. And could it be that God was using Abimelech to reject Isaac to get him to step into his purpose? Okay, let's make it plain. Could it be that God is using your husband to get you to step into your purpose? Could it be that God is using your wife to get you to step into your purpose? Could it be that God is using your children to get you to step into your purpose? Could it be that God is using that boss to get you to step into your purpose? And you keep putting all the focus on them. And God is saying, I wish you would put all the focus on your dig. I wish you would put all the focus on your altar. Because if God could get you to take the focus off of the vessel he's using and on to why he's using the vessel in the first place, he will show you that in the right season, the person that is attacking you today will come for a truce tomorrow. And, and I wish it would stop here because this is good. You mean to tell me that all of my digging has resulted in a king wanting to be my friend? So Isaac throws a party. He's celebrating. And while he's celebrating, they come in and say, you won't believe this. We just struck water, dude. It is more water than we've ever found. It's, it's in Sheba. And to this day, you can go to Sheba outside of Israel in Palestine and see this well. It's, it's huge. They said, we found a huge well that your father dug. Man, there is so much water in it. He, he wasn't expecting this. But this is the God that does exceeding and abundantly above all that you may ask or think. Once God got sacrificed, see Isaac, your father already dig, dug these wells. He's been here. He's done that. The wells never gave him the blessing. The blessing on your father's life came when he started sacrificing. It was never about the dig. It was about the sacrifice. And once he started sacrificing, they found Sheba. And what does Sheba mean? Promise. Promise. My promise. All of this digging and my sacrifice has finally led me to the promise. Who today is God saying, if I can get you to just focus on digging and sacrifice, I'll show you what your life looks like in your promise. But it's going to take you digging and it's going to take you sacrificing because God is trying to make it easy. But if you don't practice these things, Isaac, your life is going to be so hard. You know, Isaac's parents, 
<laughs> you ever met somebody and said, man, when you heard their name, like, did your parents even love you? <laughs> like, there are some names that I'm like, that name says I'll never get a good job, you know. Isaac's name meant laughter. And I get it, they laughed because, you know, God told them they would have a child in their old age and all that, you know. But Isaac's whole life, he always felt like people were laughing at him. He always thought he was a joke. But when he found his promise, he became a big deal. See, up until this point, God said, I am the God of your father. You, to be your God is TBD, to be determined. I am the God of Abraham. I claim Abraham. That's my boy. Me and Abraham are tight. I'm not yet the God of Isaac. Your, your parents' faith will not get you into your promise. It takes your experience with God. So all the way up until this point, God has been the God of Abraham. Jacob would go through this too when God would come to him. He would say, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac. The God of Jacob is to be determined. There comes a moment where you step into your own faith. There comes a moment where you break away from the pack and God becomes your God. And your name may be laughter, but when you step in the room, people are not laughing. The way you get to that kind of life, Isaac would say, is through living a life of digging where your father is and sacrificing in the places that God talks to you. This Rehoboth was the place God spoke to him. And the way you keep God speaking to you regularly is by making that place an altar. We have altar calls where we come for prayer. And really all the altar call is, is when you come up and say, I'm giving my life. I'm presenting myself as a living sacrifice. That is what it's symbolizing. But you cannot come to the altar and not have a mind made up to live a life of sacrifice. It's who I am. It's what I do. I can tell you as your pastor, I haven't always been the best guy. I was saved at 19. I had a lot of experience in me before I was saved. A lot of trauma. A lot of turmoil. A lot of trouble. Had a lot of stuff. But I think all of it put me in a place where I, to this day I have a lot of trust. A lot of trust in God. And I don't know why God took this kid from South Baltimore who lived a life of getting in trouble, a life of dragging his mother to court, drug charges, beat up an FBI agent, put him in the hospital, had to get 16 stitches in his face. And I was 18 at that point. I still don't know how God did all this stuff through my life, but I just kept digging. I just kept digging. When I started this church at 25, I'd only been saved for six years. But I kept digging. I didn't know what I was doing. I kept digging. I kept digging. I kept going after people that could help me. I just kept digging and sacrificing. And now I see that the two combined 
will make your life so easy. But it's supposed to be easier when you do it God's way. Look at the journey of Isaac and his digging. And that should look like the journey of your life. The first season, opposition. Things going wrong in your life. Most great people, if they look back at their life, their first memory that they can recall is usually a memory of trauma. It's not getting your hair done and your nails done. It's not picking up a glove and catching the ball from your dad. It's usually something traumatizing. Because that was your first well. And then as you got older, you began to see Sitna. You began to see how in life the enemy is after you. He tried to use Essex to get you to end your life. But when he saw that you survived Essex, he said, now you need some opposition. Now, now you need some attackers in your life. So I'm going to send some adversaries after you. But you kept digging. And God is saying, this is getting ready for some to be your Rehoboth season. And for those that have stepped into Rehoboth, God says, if you can get this altar in order, you can see your promise. Today, God is saying, I don't want you to make it hard anymore. I want this next chapter of your life to be so easy. Climbing up the mountain was hard. Going down the mountain shouldn't be too. Are you ready to make it easy? It is... The dig.